Good afternoon and welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. It is Tuesday, February 1st, and we are continuing our discussion on H546, an act relating to racial justice uh, statistics. And we will have a walkthrough of a new draft. Um, however, before we do that, I will turn it over to Representative Martin Lalonde, just for an update on discussions regarding a fiscal note and Anything else? Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, there's a few changes. First off, to the draft that's coming that Eric will go over. Uh, one of the changes has to do with uh, my interactions and uh, knowledge I've gained from the Joint Fiscal Office. Uh, they're working on a fiscal note. It's not finalized. Uh, the information from Kristen McClure has been provided to them. Uh, I spoke with them uh, a bit yesterday. Uh, Stephanie uh, Barrick and uh, they are still working on it. And, and the plan is to get it done by the time this ends up at the doorsteps of government operations. Um, so so the, uh, the figure in there that uh, I've updated the, the uh, appropriations amount, uh, which is a tentative figure, but it's, it's certainly closer to the uh, accurate uh, relative to what we put in there. Really, it's a placeholder in this process. So take out on that, should be good. Great. Thank you. Yeah, we're just waiting for uh, hard copies for for some of us. Um, and let's see, the draft number. I'm sorry, Eric. What is the draft number? It's for folks who it's are a, watching. Two, two point one. Okay, great. Thank you. So for um, sure. so for folks who are watching, the um, draft can be found on our today site. It's um, draft two point one. And we have our legislative counsel, Eric Fitzpatrick, who is going to walk us through this, this new draft. <clears throat> good afternoon, Eric. Thank you. Sure. Good afternoon. Uh, good to see everybody. This is Eric Fitzpatrick with the Office of Legislative Counsel, as the chair mentioned, here to walk the committee through uh, the most recent draft of H546, uh, which is a committee strike all, the second version of the committee strike all amendment which it sounds like everybody has, but I, am I right that uh, folks have it in front of them to, to look at? Yes, thank you. I'm seeing sure. nods on Zoom as well. Okay, <laughs> great, <laughs> good. Uh, well, the, it should be a, a pretty quick walkthrough um, because you remember that the, the primary group of changes the committee already looked at last time and the number of differences between this draft and the previous draft are very few and minimal, but uh, I can certainly point the committee in the direction of those. Do you want me to share the screen, Representative Grad, for a moment, or? Uh, I'm, I'm seeing um, people say no, no thank you. <laughs> okay, <laughs> good. Thanks. I know th these, are, these are pretty quick, so not one of those ones where you necessarily need to look at great detail language. So I will run through them though. Um, and it's uh, helpful, I think, when you look at the first change, which is on page four, line six, it's actually helpful to look at uh, uh, the subsection below that as well, which is the first section of uh, section 5013 data governance. So they're kind of, there are two different topics and there are no changes in subsection A of 5013, but the, the two provisions are related. So I'll mention them both. You'll see that, that what's going on here, it has to do with the division's rulemaking authority. And uh, as the bill was introduced, the uh, direction that it took was to uh, provide the division with rulemaking authority, and not only rule, not only with authority, but it was mandatory. So the division shall adopt rules uh, to establish, uh, you know, its procedures that uh, are given to it in this subchapter. The committee then, after some further witness testimony, some further discussions, made the decision that rather than uh, establish its procedures and such things as you know, which sorts of data it's gonna be collecting, those sorts of things, uh, who, from whom it would be collected, rather than do that by rule, would do that uh, by uh, adopting policies. Further commit, this is the most recent meeting, the committee then, after further discussion of that and uh, uh, dialogues with witnesses about that, it, I think it became apparent to the committee that, that the, commit, the, the division should at least have the discretion whether or not to do these things by rule or not, and that it may, the division may, upon further review or upon further study, may decide that 
Um, this where it's where it helps to look one paragraph down now because this is one example of this. For example, in section 5013A, talking about the divisions, uh, how it establishes the data that it's going to be collected. Again, in the in the draft as initially written, it said by rule. Uh, that language was struck last time, so it doesn't say by rule, but by providing the division with this overall authority, this overall discretion about whether to do these things by rule or by policy, it's going to apply it to each individual instance like this one, for example, the, the describing what kinds of data it's going to be collected. If the division, after they've worked on it, decides, well, it really makes sense to do this through the formal rulemaking process, it can, has that authority. If on the other hand, it decides, well, uh, we can do this just as well uh, with a more uh, accelerated process by, by developing policies on that, then it could do that. So it essentially provides that discretion to the division um, in all areas, but this is a good example of the one right, right below it having to do with what data is gonna be collected. So that was the policy choice at the last meeting. Is that gonna move on to the next thing if anyone, unless there's some questions on that issue. Next, uh, you'll see the next uh, uh, change is also a change from a mandatory to a discretionary uh, decision on the part of the division. And this, is ha this has to do with the public records issue that the committee was discussing in great detail over the last several meetings. You remember the, the, the place that you landed last time in general was to say, because um, well, remember the bill as introduced said that uh, none of the data uh, and none of the division's records would be public records and they wouldn't be subject to inspection. The direction now that the bill takes is to say, well, uh, we're not gonna change uh, the existing law with respect to any given piece of data's uh, coverage under the public record statute. So in other words, if, you know, cause the division is gonna be collecting this data from other state agencies, right? That's their mission is to, one of their missions is to um, be uh, a, a centralized location for the, um, you know, putting together of all this data and, and analyzing it. Uh, so the, the policy that the bill takes is say, okay, well, if, if the document or the data is um, covered by the Public Records Act to the extent that it's confidential, it's exempt from disclosure as it is, you know, with whatever that originating agency is, then that remains with the data, the document, when it comes to the division, it doesn't change. Whatever its status was, if it was public, it remains public. If it was uh, exempt from disclosure, it remains exempt. So that's the um, the uh, direction that the that the bill takes there. But you remember the, the next issue was, well, what's gonna happen when, if someone does submit a public records request? And the, again, the direction that the, the bill takes is that those requests would be submitted back to the originating agency. So rather than the, the division being saddled with all this work, like, oh, we've got all these tons of public records requests coming in. Hey, if it was governed by, by the Public Records Act when it came here, we'll send it back to whoever sent it. Um, but again, it's a change from a mandatory to a discretionary. So that rather than, again, it's trying to balance, I think was the, was the goal there. And um, rather than saying, you know, all these documents will be shipped back to the originating agency, that could be a lot of work on their part. So trying to balance that out, I think, was the idea of giving the division some discretion. Say, well, if they want to respond to it directly, they can. If they'd rather um, direct it back to whatever agency it came from, whatever, you know, state's attorney's office, sheriff's agency, et cetera, they could do that. So I'm going to take a brief moment here. I see that the sun, you probably noticed, has just come in like a, literally right through the window to my left and sky glare. I'm just going to close the curtain for a moment. <laughs> Hopefully that's a little better. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so that's the sum of that issue. And happy to pause for a moment in case there's any questions on that point. Uh, uh, not, not seeing any unless I'm not sure. No, okay. <laughs> no, not seeing any. Thank you. Sure. So the next one is the next subdivision down. And this has to do with, um, again, the, the issue of uh, uh, how it is that the division collects the data. So it's sort of the mechanics of the process. And you remember, so this language was new to the last draft, but the idea is that uh, the division identifies which state agencies has the, the 
data that it's looking for. Again, that co that comes under the same principle we talked about a moment ago, because you'll you see that the language there, there's no change here, but it's just interesting to note this. The language provides that the division shall identify which agencies or, or departments possess the necessary data. Remember, as introduced, it said by rule. That's what it said there. Doesn't say that now, just says shall identify. So that comes under the same general discretion that you put in in the beginning say, again, the division could do that by rule if they wanted, but if they felt it was preferable to do it by policy, it could, it could make that choice. So that's another example of how that, how that discretion works. But anyway, moving on in, in the subdivision, you see that um, generally speaking, uh, the way it works is that when the division identifies one of these agencies that has the data, they will then make a request to that agency to provide the data. And generally, the language is that uh, when they make that request, these state agencies have to comply. They have to provide that data. You see, the new language on line six and seven is a carve out, is an exemption to that. And that's based on testimony from the Defender General that they're in a unique position as a state agency and that they have an attorney client relationship with their clients. And that some data that they would be perhaps asked to disclose would violate their attorney client privilege and would, would violate their ethical duty to keep this information to their clients confidential. So there's a carve out that's based on, um, and there is language already that you'll see cross-referenced there in the public record statute that specifically says, if it would be a violation of someone's ethical duty uh, on the basis of their relationship to disclose this data, then it's already exempt. So it's not like this is creating a new exemption. The exemption already exists. This is just making clear that um, uh, that the Defender General's office would not be required uh, to disclose, to make any disclosures that would result in a violation of that, um, that existing statutory confidentiality that they have with their clients. So uh, I think um, after this concern was raised uh, at the last meeting, uh, I ran this language by Rebecca Turner at the Defender General's office, and she indicated that they took a look at it and they agreed that this was satisfactory to them as far as uh, making sure that they would not uh, be put in the position of having to violate their their ethical duty of confidentiality. So um, that's where this language comes from. All right. Uh, thank you for that. That's feedback. That's great. Yep. All right. Moving down then to page six, you'll see this has to do with um, the division's uh, a responsibility to make recommendations to other state and local agencies uh, regarding evidence-based practice and standards for collection. And you had it, it has previously drafted, it said not only for the collection, but also for the retention of data. This language was spotted by Tanya Marshall uh, and a couple of other people, Tanya at the, at the state archivist, as potentially, if it included the word retention, it could con conflict with other state law, which specifically provides the procedures and processes that um, state agencies have to go through with respect to data retention, you know, how long you have to retain it, what sort of processes you have to go through in order to develop a data retention policy. Um, those things are prescribed by state law and, and their, their position was, it, it might be confusing for the division to be making recommendations to other state agencies when the state agency might, might say, well, state law governs that we have to do that. And, and, and in fact, the law specifically provides that their retention procedures has to have to be approved by the archivist. So um, in order to avoid that conflict, and I think if I remember correctly, the committee testimony was that this wasn't really the purpose of this provision anyway, to deal with those sorts of retention policies. It's more about making recommendations to state agencies of how to, how to collect the data that the division needs, you know, how it is that, that they should gather it and mm -hmm. best practices for that sort of collection so that um, the word retention is, is scratched, uh, or but that the uh, collection piece is retained, and uh, that was the original idea of this of this uh, subsection anyway. So that's where that change is is all about. And I think that takes us all the way down to uh, yeah to the very end, which uh, Representative Lalonde had already mentioned, and this has to do with the. Uh, positions and the appropriation. Uh, you'll see this is at the very end of the bill, sections three and four. Uh, and I think this is, as he mentioned, based on conversations that were had with uh, Stephanie Barrett and the 
Joint Fiscal Office and um, trying to determine, well, exactly how is it that the division is going to be staffed up? And you'll see that the uh, where it's landed at the moment is that there's one full-time deputy director uh, and who's, who is, has to be an IT data analyst, as well as four full-time exempt IT data analysts at a level to be determined by the division. And that language was recommended by Stephanie at JFO to give the division some discretion as to what different level these different staff members are gonna be at. Um, and I should have highlighted it, but I didn't. The, uh, the number in the appropriation you'll see is also different. I think Representative Lalonde mentioned that earlier. It's 960. I think it was 547 or something like that in, in the previous draft. But uh, it's been updated because the staff, there's more staff now. So that's a, there's two more staff people. Uh, and I think adjusted for inflation as well. So um, that number is, has been Eric? changed. Yeah. Uh, you, you said that the former number was 547? I think that was roughly it. Um, I'm just wondering because we added two staff and it went down $8,000. No, it went, it, went, it went from 547 to 960. Oh, okay. We have 539 on here. Oh, oh that's okay. what I meant. Yes, I knew it was 500 and something. Yeah, 539. That's right. Okay, so it went, it went from, from 539 to? 960. Okay. It was just a real yeah. quick point is that uh, it, it wasn't, this price, this amount of money is not just for uh, the personnel. The, it's, it's also based on uh, the testimony of Kristen McClure as far as how much money would have to be uh, provided to the Agency of Digital Services for their uh, various work. It's kind of like overhead, essentially. Uh, so I just wanted to make that clear. Thank you. So, yeah, that's all I have for, for the walkthrough. And happy to answer any questions. Yeah, I've got a, I've got a question on who should be directed toward uh, $540,000. Kristen came in and said that IT. Uh, Services and whatever else had another five hundred forty thousand dollars, but we got four non-exempt positions or exempt positions. We've added to it. Um, only one is a uh, is an exempt position. So I thought it I under the. They're all exempt. Oh wait, let me see. Yeah, they're all. I, oh, I'm sorry. So there's a contracting position, and I remember Christmas saying something like that during the first twelve to eighteen months or year, whatever it may have been. That. There's a lot of stuff that has to take place, but what happens after that? Do we do we keep these positions on when, in essence, the program has been established, or what direction are we looking at going there? I guess. So, so that that information, I mean, that the um, more detailed information on that should be in the fiscal note when when it eventually comes through, and and it's certainly something that uh, the appropriations committee will <clears throat> dig deeply into. Uh, but yeah, we did hear testimony and I did make sure that that was passed on to the fiscal uh, joint fiscal office uh, that uh, we expected to go from five individuals to two to three individuals after two years. That's what uh, it, I said two to three years just to give you know give them some leeway as far as what they're going to put together in the fiscal note. Okay, very thanks. Oops. Thank you, Eric, thank you very much. Yeah, sure. Okay, so we're going to turn to Dr. Vitan Estrando Longo. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm really not going to be long winded. Um, as you all probably know, the RDAP meets on the second Tuesday of every month um, from 6 to 8 p.m. We did not meet in January because everyone had COVID. <laughs> um, and it made it difficult to figure out how to do a hybrid meeting when actually being in person was dangerous. So now that that bill has been signed, we're gonna be doing things remotely. So I say that just to let you know that I have not heard from the full panel I put out an email asking for feedback on this version of the bill. And frankly, a lot of the people on the panel, but not the whole panel, 
have gotten back to me on it and people feel very positively about it. Um, so I'm reporting as the chair that the, the group that wrote the report on which this bill is based um, is really firmly behind it so far. Uh, and that's the main thing that I've wanted to convey. The, as a member of the panel, I want to point out, um, I know that in the, the ACLU testified and said, specifically RDAP has called for collection analysis of high discretion, high impact decision points throughout the system in three separate reports. Most um, notably, we did that in the report of December 2020, which I asked Amber Burke to put in your, your website or whatever it is you all have. And if you look at that report, specifically um, at the section page four, prioritized list of data to be collected in the juvenile system, page six, a prioritized list of data to be collected in the adult, criminal legal system. And then finally, the first appendix, which begins on page 12, all data to be collected in both of those systems. I point this out only to say, there's a lot of question that we see or that I'm seeing in terms of where, you know, what data, what data, should we define that by rule? I'm really glad that Eric Fitzpatrick walked us through this because I just wanted to be able to point out we spent two years coming up with these lists um, about high impact, high discretion moments in these systems. And there's something here to start with. That doesn't mean that the advisory group can't make up new, you know, decide that there are other forms of data that they want. It's certainly not a zero sum game, either this or that. But I do want, I did want to point out to you that there's been a lot of work done on this already in terms of what data need to be looked at. And this is from, of course, a body that is made up of both governmental actors and stakeholders. Um, so I feel pretty clear about that and just feel like that data, which was of course part of H317, that list, um, ought to probably be at least it's something I would like to bring to your attention. Let me just leave it there. Um, I'm really glad personally that the rulemaking is sort of more flexible. I think the operative term for all of this is nimble. How to make this as nimble as possible? Because one of the things that's become very clear in the process of writing this report is that this body that has been proposed, that's now a division, needs to be profoundly nimble. I mean, we're already talking about so many positions at the beginning and that that may change later on. I'm personally very heartened and certainly on behalf of the RDAP and heartened that that nimbleness is being taken into account by the legislature. So I'd like to thank you for that. Um, I think that's really all that I have to say I um, wanna leave enough time for Director Davis to deliver her comments, which I think are more focused. And given that this will be something that will be within shouting distance of her purview, I would really like her to be able to hold forth on that now. Well, thank you, thank you. We, we do have time to, to hear you, I know you, to, to go at, at two, um, but I want to make sure that you that you feel like you can say everything that you'd like to say. <laughs> Got it. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Any um, questions? Okay. Hey. Then can I please welcome Director Davis? Thank you so much for for joining us. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. When I started it, I'm just looking for my notes here. Thank you for inviting me to share more thoughts on this latest draft and thank you to Eric for walking us through it. I just had a couple of notes on some of the new provisions. Most of those notes are no objection. 
but I just wanted to call those out specifically. And then I did have a point of confusion, actually, or a question at the end on one of the provisions. I think I missed that part. So we'll get to that afterwards. Uh, for the record, Susanna Davis, Racial Equity Director for the state. And let me begin with page number four. The um, provisions that strike out by rule to allow for that level of flexibility. I, we have no objection to that. I think that it also is bringing us closer in line with what we've heard from some of our advocacy community like the ACLU. Um, we think about the amount of time that it would take us to go through a rulemaking process and what that would mean in terms of being able to stand up the office and really get um, solid analyses underway. So um, we have no objection to striking the by rule portion. Remaining on page four, I am also mm, line number 21, copying under the Public Records Act, shall remain, oh yes. So keeping the exemptions that are existing over certain records that are being transmitted, um, I think that that sounds fine. It's in line with what we've heard from the archivist and the chief data officer. So we have no objections to that either. I'm on page five now, line number two, um, making it such that the transmitting agency would be considered the sole records custodian for purposes of responding to requests for data. No objection there. I think it helps to streamline the process a bit. Um, carving out those roles is, is gonna be extremely important. And I wonder just from a data analysis perspective, um, you know, sometimes we get data from transmitting agencies and have to do a bit of cleaning up on our end. And so when those data are requested, presumably this provision would mean that those data unclean are going to be <clears throat> what is provided by that sole records custodian, not the version, um, not the resulting version in the division. I'm not articulating this well because I'm not yeah. good at math, but I need someone understands me. I'm sorry, Suzette, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but um, we um, want to make sure, are you looking at draft 2.1? Uh, oh, goodness. Because our, our page numbers are, and our line numbers are different than yours, so I don't, I don't know if it's the draft or how it comes up on your screen. It, it's possible I'm not. I, I'm seeing a lot of the strikeouts and highlights that you all mentioned. So I hope I'm on a draft that if is not the same, at least is substantially similar. So okay. maybe we'll not do line numbers and I'll just try to be clear about describing which section I'm discussing. Okay, great, thank you. Yep, thank you. So I am moving down to 5013, section A2, provision that reads, an agency or department identified pursuant to the subdivision shall, upon request, provide the division with any data that the division requests slash deems is relevant. Do you all have that in your draft somewhere? That's uh, one draft behind, I, I believe. Um, mm. late and a dollar short. <laughs> so yeah, what would be best for uh we could have our uh the committee assistant email you the latest draft right now Amber, could you, yeah she, she's doing that so if you just hang with us for a moment we'll give it to you to make sure you got the right one there's not been substantial changes but that's that's an important part of uh that's an important change that you're looking at right now might be helpful to just on that particular line, those bracketed phrases that you're looking at, at was a choice between requests or deems relevant. And the draft mm -hmm. that, that is current, they made the latter choice. So that would be okay. any, any information that the division determines is relevant, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you for that. Um, I, I was just going to say that we didn't see a, a substantial, um, a material distinction between the two. So. Right we were going to say no objection to either or no preference for either. While I wait for that draft, I'm going to, I'm going to keep, I'm going to take the risk that what I, the further comments that I have might still be relevant. Um, so I'm going to, oh, there you go. 
Can I just uh, have you back up for just a moment, uh, Susanna? Just, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. I mean, Director Davis, I'm sorry. Um, so so the, uh, the previous uh, page that you were talking about, uh, just, just to be clear, uh, and you'll see in the change that uh, we've given the division uh, the flexibility to either do a rulemaking or to just do it by policy. Just FYI, if you want to flag that when you get the, the version to see if presumably getting more flexibility is not something that you would uh, disparage, but I just wanted to point that out. Thank you, Representative. Yes, we would agree and, and would be quite fine with that. So I now have both drafts open so that I can compare, which means I can no longer see any of you. So please feel free to uh, interrupt as needed. And we're going to make you bigger. Okay. Susanna, would it be helpful if Eric just did a quick comparison again for you? I would hate to take more time doing that. I think we're prob I think we're probably okay. Thank you. Whatever, whatever works for you. Thank you. Sure. Mm -hmm. Office of Defender General shall not be required to make disclosures. We would be fine with that. Um, yeah, no objection to the provision regarding ODG disclosures in violation of 317. <coughs> So since this draft incorporates the previous draft that I was probably looking at, um, I'm just going to summarily say that all the other provisions to which we had no objection appear to be included now. So from version whatever to the previous version, we're fine with. And now from that version to this one is what I'm reviewing now. New positions. Time exam. We agree. And then the fiscal note, which has been updated to reflect that. Great. The only other um, thing that I had a comment on, and again, this is from the previous draft, so it's probably moot at this point, but there was one provision in there that mentioned creating an active and ongoing, here we are, implement an active and continuing management program for records and information with support provided by the archivist and ADS. And the one thing I was just gonna say in response to that was that as we consider resourcing that work, just to consider that that may require external training for any agencies around the state that interact with the division. So just as we think about supporting uh, an active and continuing management program that that may not necessarily be only internal facing and may have some level of external engagement as well. And, and that's where exactly, uh, Director? I will tell you right now. That is on page number five, line number 11. So it's subsection 5013A3. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Just one other follow up question. So you're not suggesting no any other language, you're just making a comment to make us aware of that. Is that correct? I just want to make sure. Correct. Okay, correct. Thanks. I just wanted to make sure that as we consider the updated. Um, any updated resourcing, whether it's personnel, time, or financial resourcing that we consider that there may need to be an external engagement component to that active and continuing management program, um, but no suggested language change. So, so is that, I'm just wondering if I can jump into another question if you, okay. So we put in here uh, based on um, Kristen McClure's recommendation, uh, the staffing. 
uh, at the uh, page 11 on the newest version. Um, one full-time exempt deputy director, four full-time information technical technology data analysts, although there's different levels of analysts, I understand, but we didn't need to get into that. Um, I just wanted to flag that, 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 is, that is still, that, that's I think from my perspective, the biggest question still on this bill, is that the right makeup to get this done? But my understanding also is that's really more of an appropriations issue and probably government operations. I think our job here has mostly been to get this policy together <clears throat> as much as possible. Uh, but having said that, do you have any input on this at, at this point? I mean, are we in the ballpark? Uh, because we still are in the process of getting a, a fiscal note. And if this is something that's way off, it's, it's probably a good time to at least modify it, even though it's going to go through the ringer of the appropriations uh, committee's process. Yes, I think that you certainly are in the ballpark, and I am inclined to lean heavily on um, Kristen McClure's testimony regarding what staffing is needed to maintain a data operation of this size and nature. So I would say that if, if these figures are closely adherent to what she has recommended, then I'm willing to, I'm willing to take those as accurate. But you do raise a good point with the creation of the Office of Racial Equity, with the creation of a lot of different and new positions and offices in state government. I think it's always really important that we not be satisfied with just, just the initial rollout and assume that we've got it right on the front end first time around. I phrase that very clunkily, but what I'm trying to say is that we'd be willing to revisit and adjust as needed. And that may be an upward adjustment or a downward adjustment. But given that it's a new venture, I would be comfortable if we could at least informally commit to just revisiting the topic in another year and saying, did we get it right? And if not, how can we make sure that the division is adequately resourced? Thank Madam, you. Madam Chair. Yes. Uh, we would have that option collectively, uh, depending on which committee uh, has jurisdiction at the time during budget adjustment uh, uh, at the beginning of the next session. Uh, that would be that prime opportunity to do that. And hopefully, you know, we'd be getting reports back uh, prior to that time so that as one of the active committees of jurisdiction of the bill, at least from the policy perspective, we could speak in support of, let's say, a change if necessary. And I see Barb, I see Barb shaking her head because she's used to, you know, helping us through those maneuvers at that time of year. Thank you, Coach. Barbara, uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Barbara. I, in listening um, to uh, our last to the last discussion, I'm wondering if something stronger needs to be in there because then we're sort of at the good mercy of saying, you know what, like now we know this, and I don't know how each administration or budget addresses that. So I wonder about um, language of even a organizational functional assessment will be completed with um, uh, recommendations for future FY funding based on a year of experience and an assessment or something. So it doesn't become oh, now Ms. Davis is asking for something more. It's like, no, this is part of how things work and not um, somebody going back and saying, I need more. Because you make your best guess at the beginning, but you don't know. Like sometimes you need something totally different that you didn't even count on. And so if it is sort of assumed in there that an assessment and... Um, 
uh, review will occur prior to the, you know, the, in time for the FY blank budget um, or to report back, then I think that gives everybody a good common understanding now. And it doesn't like leave surprises for later or because it could be all new people and they could be like, well, why, why do you, you just got all this? I mean, I've asked the same thing of the uh, judiciary when they come in and say they want more positions. I'm like, but you just got more. Like, what do you want more for? But um, so I think, I think it's good business to do that. And I don't know, that's my thought. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, Ken. So the current administration has already got uh, Susanna that is basically in charge and then authorized two more positions already. One you've already filled, correct? Correct. So then a lot of this stuff that what we're going over is more data that's being collected and we're, we're already collecting a lot of this data anyway. The big thing seems to be is the storage of the data. Is am I on kind of the right format here? You know, I would probably, if I may, I would I would say a big thing is the storage, but perhaps the big thing is the analysis and what we do with it. And that's something that I think that expecting existing staff to take that on without it having been thought of ahead of time in creating job descriptions and hiring for existing people, we might end up getting what we pay for, so to speak. So, um, you know, creating a new mechanism through which we're going to do this deep analysis is to some extent going to require new people. Okay, so we're already collecting. So now we need more people to analyze the data that's coming in. It's on you. Go ahead. Yeah. First of all, we're not entirely collecting. There are data, if you look at the report that the RDAP put together in 2020, there are data that are simply not collected. It's just not done. What we got into as we were writing this report was a whole lot of, don't we already have, we were asking the same questions that you're asking now. Don't we have people who can do this? And the answer after two years is no, because what lay people like ourselves think about data management is not what data management actually is, particularly when some of the data as the report that you now have um, it, from 2020 points out, there's just, there are holes. There are simple holes. And some of the data is present, but some of the data is not. And then on top of that, they, all the systems that are used in the criminal and juvenile justice systems do not necessarily speak to one another. Making them speak to one another is a really simple sentence. It is not a simple process. Okay, thanks for now. Um, Madam Speaker? Yes, yes. I mean, I'm not <laughs> you've just been promoted. <laughs> uh, Madam Chair, uh, Representative Goslin, um, thinking in terms of when we got our report, uh, the committee from Justice Reinvestment 2, one of their final recommendations addressed what Dr. Longo was talking about related to the holes in the data. Uh, and that was one of um, Justice Reinvestment 2's findings. So you know, we've got that other piece of uh, outside resourcing identifying what RDAP 
had further analyzed and identified. So that that's just another point of point of reference, and one of the things that we've asked uh, the, the Joint Fiscal Office to do in their analysis, you know, of the fiscal note is, you know, what types of reinvestment might occur as the result of this particular work. Thank you. Okay. Ready for my reply? If, if you'd like to, yeah. Okay, sure. thanks. Yeah. So, so ADS has already stated that in order, they can't do the work there. Well, it'll go through them, but it's going to be uh, sub subcontracted out, correct? Yeah. And that's a lot more money than than what it would normally cost. So anyway, I, and don't misunderstand me. I know this is important work. I'm just trying to put everything together with all the different different agencies and everything that um, I don't think data is up to date on anything we do, nor is equipment or 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 what is taken to do it. I'm just trying to wrap my head around all this right now. That's all. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Representative. It, it, this, we, we had a discussion earlier today on another project, um, you know, in between, you know, I don't know which meeting it was, but, but anyways, it, it was very similar because some of these things are so complex and, and with the way we've structured the new data system and the actual agency of digital services, you know, was to hopefully put us in a more uh, responsive environment for statewide data and all of the functionality of the systems that support it. Then came this weird thing, COVID. And as you recall, when we had testimony from ADS, which was uh, Director uh, McClure, Kristen McClure, she spoke directly to the fact that they are outsourcing more work because that's the only way they can get the work of the state completed. And some of the, the costs that she shared with us included those additional costs. The, again, um, the Joint Fiscal Office is working on a pretty detailed fiscal note for us. So we'll be able to look at that piece of the dynamic, you know, in total. So, um, you know, just as we continue our discussion. But thanks for the question, Ken. So I, I, I understand that, but currently we don't even have the workforce in this state to handle what, what we have now. There's right. no question about it. The other thing is, is kind of from the outside looking in on this whole thing, or certainly how I look at things is, we make it extremely hard for one division to talk to the other to get the information that we need to do, or the divisions to all work together to get the divisions that we need because one, one branch wants to protect this part of their, their uh, information and so on and so forth. And that's one thing that since we started with this bill, that's, and maybe that's how government works that drives that, just, uh, I, I, I don't understand, but it makes it so nobody can do their job. So you can't, or do it as efficiently, uh, efficiently to get from point A to point B to just get the job done. And that is frustrating on this guy as a legislator's um, mind trying to deal with all this stuff. If that makes any sense. Well, well, actually, it does, 
because it's a shared understanding, I would imagine it might be said a different way as you go around this table in our committee room, but you would find that that's a shared feeling on all of our parts. I don't know how many times when I was on different committees over over my, my tenure, you'd go, why in the heck isn't this you know, health department talking to the, you know, children's department and talking to, you know, and yet all of them would be in the same room at the same time going, pointing fingers, you know, like, no, they've got it. This one's got it. You know, I, I hear you. That's probably the most frustrating part of our job as policymakers is in, you know, not being able to have a centralized data system that allows us to respond more um, clearly from a policy perspective, you know. So I, I think you'd find it it's shared. So let me put let me put this another way that the way I can best explain it. In my mind, we are complicating this situation so much that it doesn't need to be complicated. And it's making it much more difficult, much more expensive for every, everybody. And it's, it's, it's frustrating because I want to get this through and I want to do it as efficiently as possible and have, have it work without setting up to be a failure. And I don't want to get, I don't want to spend a lot of extra money that doesn't need to be done, but I want it done. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Thanks. I, I, I'm with you. <laughs> oh, too well, my friend. Barbara, I see your your hand is up. I'm not sure if that's from before or if you want to um to chime in. Oh, right Sorry, it was a um it was uh from before. Uh, Martin, did you? Uh, have we gotten into discussion? It seems. <laughs> <laughs> So you know, that we've laid out what we think. Well, we've laid out what what our DAP and uh, that includes a broad range of people in criminal justice and throughout state government and community members have suggested as needed, and that we personally have seen as needed over the last several years when we've been trying to make policy without sufficient data to understand how our policies are working. That the need has been there, and and this defines how to get at the need in the best manner based on recommendations from this group that looked at this all the last year. Um, what we're also doing though is leaving it largely up to the administration. We're not telling you know, yes, I have, you know, we, we have in here a bill in the bill, the five positions, but that comes from the administration. We're trying, we're leaving it to the administration to tell us what do they need to get this work done that we've laid out in here as informed by the two reports from RDAP over the past couple of years. And this is what we've learned so far from Kristen McClure. And I'm sure we're gonna learn a lot more when it goes to government operations, which really deals with this kind of thing much more than we do in this committee. And when it gets to appropriations, they're gonna deal with this, but it's really administration, tell us what you need to do, what we've asked you to do. And this is what we've gotten from them so far. So I just want to make that clear that we're not making this part up as far as what resources they need to do the work. And actually, before I um, Director Davis, I want to give you a chance. Do um, you have any comments here? I, I do actually. Um, I wanted to respond to Representative Gosselin's comment because I think it's a great one and I agree wholeheartedly. We make it very difficult. And I say we, not Vermont, but we government at all levels around the country, make it very difficult for departments and divisions to talk to each other in some of the work that we're doing. And I find that that's especially true for members of the public. If we, as people within the system, are frustrated with that siloing and that compartmentalization of work, then I think what bills like this are intended to address is the perceived opacity or the, the, the maze really that that whole process presents for members of the public. And so I see this as a way not only to 
break down some of those intra-governmental silos, but also to provide that added layer of transparency for the people who are um, perhaps who have the least technical expertise in this, but people who are represented in our data nonetheless. So I just wanted to add, add that on. Thank you. Thank you. So the only for Director Davis or well, all I'm going to say is 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 uh, uh, Representative Lalam what he said. The current administration set this up, brought you on board to go and help develop it and develop this and say what you you need. Certainly, the current administration has a role already in what they want, where this is going. And it's just, in my mind, it's gotten way more complicated than what it needs to be. It needs, I, I wish, which is impossible, but I wish government would run like a business. But we'll figure it out. Good. And Director Davis, I, I welcome you <laughs> to respond or, or not, but just want to make Make sure you're part of the uh, discussion when you'd like to be or able to be. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I'm not certain that I am maybe the best person to respond. I definitely share the representative's concerns about um, growing government. There's nothing that I wish for more on the planet than for rules like mine not to have to exist or work like this to have to be done. But I think that as long as we're going to do it, let's do it well enough that we then don't have to anymore. Sorry, unstable internet. Uh, I was saying that, um, you know, I, I think there's a good deal of overlap between my sentiments and the representatives, but maybe this is part of a, a deeper discussion about um, what functions we, we want state government to have and, and who should be at the table when we're laying those out. I, I agree, thank you. <coughs> Anything else? <coughs> thank you, thank you very much. You are, you are frozen, but I think and hope you can <laughs> hear me saying thank you very much for, for joining us. Uh, I can, thank you so much, man. Great, thank you, thank you so much. So, um, committee members, I would like to um, keep going and just postpone our, our break because we do have um, another witness uh, joining us. And so, Erica Rickard, who is the project director of Pew Charitable oh, Trust, there you are. So, thank you so much for, for reaching out to um, our legislative council, Eric Fitzpatrick. Um, and so, I will turn it over to you. <coughs> Describe your role and your interest, and I'm curious of how you found out about this bill. It's very exciting. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Thanks for the opportunity to provide some testimony on the act related to racial justice statistics. My name is Erica Rickard. I direct a project at the Pew Charitable Trusts focused on modernizing our nation's civil legal system. So we support efforts to deliver more efficient, equitable, and open civil courts. Uh, what brings me here today is that our research has been following the role that state courts play in addressing racial disparities, and uh, we applaud the committee's efforts to address the lack of high quality, publicly available data on racial justice through this bill. Uh, and we'd like to urge the committee to consider some of our research findings that support expanding the scope of the bill to include data on civil legal case types, such as uh, eviction and debt collection lawsuits in addition to what's currently contemplated. So while strides have been made nationally and in Vermont to improve the transparency and the quality of juvenile and criminal justice data, civil justice data often remains overlooked. And that, that lack of data tends to obscure the impact that courts and legal systems have on some of their most frequent users. So in Vermont, for example, in 2019, the courts received over 19,000 civil and probate case filings, which is 3,000 more than the number of criminal cases that were filed that year. And debt collection and eviction lawsuits are the two most common types of civil court cases. That's 
a number that's grown exponentially over the last 30 years, and it's really transformed the business of state courts. Debt and eviction cases create serious economic and social instability to thousands of families facing them in Vermont each day, and yet they largely fly under the radar due to lack of data. There's currently only one state in the country that reports statewide data on filings and outcomes of debt collection lawsuits. That's Texas. Others, including Vermont, typically aggregate their civil and their small claims cases into a single category, which prevents policymakers and the public from knowing the scale of eviction or debt collection cases in the state and from knowing who is most impacted. Research in other jurisdictions has shown that debt collection and eviction lawsuits disproportionately affect communities of color. Some research has shown that majority black neighborhoods are twice as likely to receive a debt collection lawsuit and to face a default judgment or an automatic win for the debt collector compared to majority white neighborhoods, even when controlling, even when controlling for income. And similarly, uh, in evictions, the eviction lab found that black renters experience the highest average rates of eviction filings and eviction judgments in cities across the country, which is almost double the rate of their white counterparts. These disparities can serve to further exacerbate the racial wealth gap, they can inhibit racial justice efforts, but there is a solution. If we're able to take case filing and docket data and link it to demographic data, much as has been described earlier today, that can reveal existing disparities within judicial outcomes and it can also guide decision makers on policies, on where to target resources like eviction diversion programs or rental assistance funds. And it can also be a critical tool for identifying places to enforce or develop reforms for housing and consumer related policies and processes, which can impact racial justice and due process in these civil case types. Once again, we appreciate the opportunity to submit testimony. I've submitted a more detailed analysis and writing, but I'm eager to answer any questions that folks might have. Thank you, thank you so much. Appreciate your, your testimony. Any questions? A minute, Martin, I can't tell you. Yeah, I was thinking, no, I don't think so. I think I'm good. <clears throat> uh, okay. yeah. I, I'm just wondering if you can tell us more about how Texas does track this data. Sure. So uh, what, what Texas did in uh, 2013 was to create a subcategory of uh, their small claims or their uh, justice of the peace courts cases to include a specific category for debt collection lawsuits. They call it debt claims. And what that enabled them to do was despite having uh, kind of a fragmented uh, case management system, and fragmented use of technology across the state, they were able to have consistent data labels that enables us to be able to tell what a debt collection lawsuit looks like, regardless of the dollar amount and regardless of the courthouse. So you can see statewide the number of debt collection lawsuits and what actually happens in those cases. And then do, do they um, also collect eviction data or is no state collecting, like how is the eviction data collected and how would you recommend, what's your recommendation around that? Eviction data has been uh, pretty scattershot across the country. We're able to see in some jurisdictions pretty granular level information about uh, who is filing eviction cases, what the outcomes are, but often what it takes is a deep dive from a third party uh, researcher because while that, that data may be available, it's not generally publicly reported in aggregate statistics provided by the judiciary. That Rather, that information is something that takes a little bit of extra effort to pull out administrative data from what the court's already collected in order to report it publicly. Got it, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. And, and we will look at your the testimony, your written testimony, and certainly if we have any, any questions, we'll get back to you. And again, thank you. Thank you so much for, for reaching out, appreciate <clears throat> it. Take care. Thank you.